for this morning's call to worship. Please join in this responsive reading found in your bulletin. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the people with equity and guide all the nations upon the earth. The earth has brought forth its increase. May God, our own God, bless us. Please be seated. And join in this morning's opening prayer, also found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you crown the year with your goodness. We praise that you have ever fulfilled your promise that while earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. We bless you for the beauty of earth and sky and sea and for the providence that year by year supplies our need. We thank you for your blessing on the work of those who plowed the soil and sowed the seed and have now gathered in the fruits of the earth. And with our thanksgiving for these blessings, accept our praise, O God, for the eternal riches of your grace in Christ our Lord, to whom with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, be all glory and honor and worship forever and ever. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 28, which may be found on page 27 of the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Four, it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. To each, according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? 
then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Great time when we gather with family or friends, a time when we are mindful of all the good things that have come to us from God's hand. I wish you all a blessed and wonderful day on Thursday. Now, no doubt, somewhere while we're gathering, perhaps there'll be a, a slight temptation to kind of revisit all of the contentiousness that we have been through through these past uh, many months around the election. And I'd like to suggest on Thursday that maybe politics should just take a holiday. <laughs> we are deeply divided. We continue to be deeply divided. Lots of strong opinion everywhere. But it might be good just on a day to set it aside. To remember the good things, to remember the blessings, to remember what we value in one another. And just because we're invited to an argument <laughs> doesn't mean that we have to go. You know, sometimes when I work with married couples or uh, couples that are tr negotiating their relationship, there'll often be difficult issues and every now and then, I try to give a little uh, pastoral advice. I try to say, well, why don't you just put a little fence around what you're arguing about? Yes, Kathy, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> just put a fence around it. You, you don't have to talk about everything all the time. And indeed, some ways, it's easier to get to resolution of complex matters if we're patient and slow. That doesn't mean we back down or we give up or that we don't care. It just means that there's a certain cadence that comes in relationships. And if we can live with that cadence, we can do the other things that we value, even while we struggle with some of the things that are more difficult. Sometimes a little break, a little rest, allows us to touch the deeper things that bind us together. Now, there'll be plenty of arguments in the past, and no doubt there'll be plenty of arguments in the future, but from time to time, there's a need just to pause, to trust, and to rest. I heard such a story that maybe it will warm your heart as it warmed mine. Elementary school children were on a bus, one of whom was African American. She was approached by two other children who looked her in the eye and said, well, now you have to ride in the back of the bus. She got up, went to the very front seat of the bus, and sat right down. <laughs> Amen. Well, this morning I invite us to be attentive to the, to the parable of the talents. It's a parable as it's told in Matthew's Gospel. 
is a powerful and uh, dearly known parable. But there are some things that you might not be aware of. That is, where the parable is positioned in the gospel according to Matthew, it's almost at the very end of Jesus' uh, teaching ministry. He'll tell that parable, he'll tell another parable, and then the events of Holy Week will commence. This parable of the talents is one of the concluding parables in Matthew's gospel meant to sum up and clarify so much of what Jesus had said before. And when he says a certain master went out on a journey, everyone knows that the journey that the master is about to take is the journey to the cross where Jesus will be executed, where he will die. The other thing that's rather interesting is a talent. I learned this week that a talent is roughly equal to $150,000. No paltry sum. To be given five talents would be to be given $750,000. To be given two talents would be to be given $300,000. So as Jesus tells the parable, it's really not a small investment on the master's part, but a large one. Just as the investment that God puts into you and to me is not a small, trivial life, but something large and grand. So the master gives five talents to one and two to another, and to a third he gives one talent. And as you know, the first two go and they use the gift they've been given and it multiplies, it doubles, while the third, well, it doesn't work out so well. And the point of the parable spins not just on the cautiousness of the third, but the motivation of the third. While the others come and report their success, the third, who was overly cautious, reveals the source of his caution, which is the problem, saying, Master, I knew you to be a harsh, man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering seed where you had not scattered. The problem for this third steward is not about his financial abilities, it's about his perception of God. He sees God as harsh, cruel, and so he behaves cautiously. See, it really can't be about the money because the master had just doled out $1.2 million and he had received a 100% return on most of it. He, he had diversified his portfolio. He was prepared 
for loss. But what the master criticizes is the very misunderstanding of who God is. That God is not harsh. God is loving and God is just. And if we let that truth settle into who we are as a people, well, that truth will call forth great things from us, exciting things, powerful things that enrich us and that enrich the lives of those around us. You see, at the heart of stewardship, it's understanding who God is. That God is not harsh and condemning, but God is gracious. God is loving. Well, through these Sundays of the stewardship campaign, I've been lifting up different things that we're, we'd like to do, things that your generosity and your faithful support of the church makes possible. A couple of weeks ago, I told you that we were interested in engaging in some programs that would uh, help strengthen our ministry. I had my very first uh, workshop on the culture of renewal this past week, and it was exciting and invigorating, and I thank you for your willingness to step out and engage that. I think we'll learn many good things through that. And Misty is, Misty is in the process of putting together a ministry team to uh, help us focus on some church growth and outreach initiatives. Last week, I told you that we were interested in strengthening our programmings with children, youth, and uh, adults, particularly rejoicing in the fact that we have a strong ministry with uh, high school age people and we'll work on that. But this morning I thought I'd like to just uh, help us all appreciate and understand what a wonderful gift that this building is here on the corner of Clinton and Norwich Street. And so I just spent a few time looking through the monthly calendar and uh, discovered some things. We have a wonderful preschool here in the life of our church called Step Ahead. We have about 75 children who come here through the course of a week to have their very first experience in education. It is a kind gentle, nurturing environment which helps children be prepared to enter into the more rigorous educational activities that will come later in their journey. The truth be told that we, uh, we charge very little for the use of the building for that preschool and probably if we did not help it as we do, the tuition would probably be much higher and probably out of reach for many who need such an experience. I think we can all be really proud of what that ministry means in those families' lives. We've got a wonderful scout troop. They're here Mondays and Thursdays and they bring such vitality and such joy. But what you might not know is that we have one of the largest AA groups on Wednesday night. Sometimes there are over 100 people who come into this building to find the strength and the support that they need 
to rise above being addicted. We have a very small group that meets on Sunday morning. And uh, one of my Sunday morning rituals is I, I get up fairly early and sometimes I sit in the living room of the parsonage. And from that uh, seat on the couch, I look out the window and I can see the entryway to the parking lot. And when I see a car pulled into the parking lot at six o'clock or so, I stop, I pray. I ask God to bless that person who's making an effort. And I pray that that effort will be successful. Every Friday night, the Capital City Gay Men Group meets here in our building. And a people who experience so much prejudice and so much ridicule in so many other places find in you a gracious host, a generous friend. We are blessed with a wonderful building that we did not build. Well, a couple of people here may have built it. But now it's given to us, to our care. It's often a favorite site when there are uh, tragic events and the community needs to gather. We, uh, we housed the interfaith rally after the shooting events in Orlando. This piece of real estate is a blessing. Some of the groups who use the building are able to support us and share what they can. Other groups, not so much. But it's our gift. You might be interested to know, I, I just looked through the budget briefly, that it costs us about $80,000 a year to uh, operate the building, to heat it, to pay the utilities, to clean it, to maintain it, and we probably aren't able to maintain it as, uh, uh, as much as we would like. There are many things that we put off and haven't done. But I think that this building really is a resource, not just for us, but for many, many others. You know, sometimes when I think of this parable of the talents, I, uh, I add another scene to it in my own mind. I hope you'll forgive me for taking certain liberties. I imagine a fourth steward, a fourth person who uh, meets the master, kind of sheepish. He starts out by saying, I'm sorry, I lost five talents. I've got nothing. But I had a good idea. I bought acres of land down by a river. And I leased that land to families that they might farm. Now, they didn't have resources to buy the seed and to buy livestock. So I invested that money in them. The deal was that, that when the harvest came, they would repay the loans. It was going pretty well for a while, Master, but, well, something happened. Someone upstream diverted the river. Maybe the Romans built an aqueduct and took all the water, I don't know. but with no water. Soon the crops failed. The families were forced to move. 
I lost every dime you gave me, Master. Sorry about that. I feel bad that I lost your money. But I feel even worse for all those families who got hurt. And I imagine the master saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Here's five more talents. Try again. You see, we do not belong to a punitive God, a God that punishes, but a God that is rich in mercy, rich in grace, overflowing with an abundant love and a big heart for the well-being of all. We belong to a God of justice and of mercy. Amen. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.